further down the presentation, but that you also can't discriminate uh, for disability. So what are some of the things that fall under discriminatory practices? Um, well, the obvious one is refusing to rent or sell um, to somebody based if they have one of those, uh, fall under one of those categories. Um, refusing to negotiate. I mean, even, even not willing to negotiate with somebody because of they meet one of those criteria is also, um, uh, you, you also can't do that. Um, then you see some of the other ones. I wanted to, to point out some of the ones that, uh, you know, are a little bit uh, counterintuitive or not, not something you would think about. Uh, but for instance, discouraging rental or purchase, like uh, a real estate broker, um, if it can't tell somebody, well, you know, you, you probably don't want to look at houses over here because, um, you know, I, I don't think that's within your price range. But what they're trying to say is, hey, you know, there's people that look more like you over here on this side of the, uh, of the city. Uh, you may not want to come over here. Um, similarly, blockbusting, I didn't know this term before I was preparing for this presentation. Blockbusting, I was thinking blockbuster. <laughs> blockbusting is, is, the, is the act of when somebody, uh, usually a, a, a realtor or a real estate agent is, has sold a house uh, to, to somebody and then they go around the neighborhood and said, hey, uh, you know, you may want to start selling your house because, you know, these, these type of people might be coming in, are going to be coming in here soon. Uh, you know, I, 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 you, you may want to start selling your house now. Um, that's what blockbusting uh, is. Um, discriminatory practices also. So uh, harassing, harassment, that's um, uh, something that you don't think about. But for instance, if a landlord says, um, and this is, it covers sexual harassment. So because that's gender related or could be gender related um, and falls under sex for the discrimination, a landlord can't, uh, can't say, hey, I will, um, with, you don't have to pay me this, this rent if you do X, Y, and Z, right? So that would also fall under um, the FHA discrimination practice. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, failing to provide reasonable accommodations uh, for discriminating against uh, disabled folks. Um, so unintentional acts um, or acts by others. So uh, some of these things are, like I said, are not really intuitive. You, you don't really think about these things, but, but what do they mean when you're acting uh, in a discriminatory way? Um, disparate treatment and disparate impact are two different ways that somebody can discriminate um, against somebody and, and it has different meanings and, and they're disguised different ways but but at the same time have the same consequences. So disparate treatment um, is basically treating someone differently because he or she is a member of a protected class. That one's pretty obvious, a disparate treatment. It's um, a landlord refuses to rent to a family because the family's African American, right? Um, landlord refuses to rent it to a family with children because he doesn't want to rent to children. You can't, you can't do that. Those are pretty uh, obvious examples of discrimination and those are considered disparate uh, treatment. So what happens when you call, uh, you know, J or I, because uh, you want to file a lawsuit or something, what, what, what is somebody because of discrimination, what would they have to prove? Well, if you're the one that's saying, hey, I'm being discriminated against, um, you'd have to provide direct evidence of the discrimination, or you'd have to demonstrate that, hey, anybody can see that this, this is discrimination. He said, I'm not renting to you because you are black or because you are female. Usually that never happens, right? I mean, that's never going to happen. Um, and so, but if you're able to do that, then the defendants or whoever you're suing, on the other hand, has to provide a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the action. So they can say, well, no, no, actually it wasn't because um, you were black. It was because you didn't qual your credit score was not good or because your reference from your last landlord was, didn't, wasn't good. Um, and so if they do that, then uh, the plaintiff, the one who's, who's complaining about being discriminated against would then have to show, but that defendant's reason is bogus. It's pretextual is what it's called. It's, they're, they're using that now as a reason but they're backdooring it. That wasn't the real reason. Now they're just trying to create a reason for why they didn't want to, to rent to, to me. Um, disparate impact is a little bit different and more difficult to, to show, but that's when there's a neutral practice or policy that disproportionately impacts the protected class. So um, 
it's not necessarily on its face discriminatory. Um, it's just when, when that, whatever action or policy is being implemented, it reinforces some sort of discrimination. So if, um, uh, for instance, if, uh, if an apartment complex only allows people with full-time jobs, well, then that could possibly discriminate against disabled veterans because they can't have full-time jobs. Um, that could have a, a disparate uh, impact as to uh, lower income minority folks. Um, I mean, think about it. If, if one of the requirements is that everybody has to have a full-time job, but what if you have an, uh, a person who just inherited a bunch of money? Well, um, you know, you're gonna, now you're gonna say that they can't work. Obviously that's an extreme example, but you know, sometimes it, it, um, you see this a lot of times with, with cities. If a city decides to prohibit um, housing that would be affordable to working class people and say, well, that's not the type of housing we want in the city, you can see how that's going to have a, a disparate impact as to uh, certain classes of, of, of folks, um, the, those that are in the lower socioeconomic uh, scale. So um, one that I didn't think about, and this is from a lender's perspective. So if a, if a lender has a policy of allowing its loan officers um, to overcharge some, some people uh, at, at that loan officer's discretion, um, well, that could possibly have an impact because what if that guy has a bias for, hey, if you're a, 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 somebody who I find attractive, I'm going to give you a better uh, rate or cut you off on some charges and not. So that can have some sort of discriminatory um, disparate impact. Um, so what happens if somebody wants to claim, hey, this is not an overt discriminatory action, but I, I think that the policy is, is providing for discrimination so the person who's complaining has the burden to show that uh, that, that person that you're complaining about practice has a discriminatory effect on them, not just on people in general, but it's got to, it's got to, you got to show that it has a, an effect on them and how it harmed them. And then the defendant would then have to show that, no, there's a, there, there's a legitimate justification for the policy. And this is why and you have to explain it. Um, and then, then if that happens then the plaintiff, the person who's complaining, uh, would have uh, uh, to show that, and it's a big burden, that the defendant reached, could have done what they wanted to do, what they intended to do in a different way without being discriminated, discriminatory. Um, so that's uh, discrimination uh, under the Fair Housing Acts uh, in a nutshell. There's some exemptions, which I talked about before, uh, three in particular, the familial status exemption. Uh, one example of that is, uh, uh, um, nursing homes, um, you know, assisted living centers, you can have, uh, you know, and, and say that I don't, we are only going to take people above a certain age. That's exempt. Also, if you own a, a property uh, that has no more than four units uh, and, and you didn't have to go through a broker or, or anything, you can say, I only want these sort of people to, to work, to, to live in my other three units that I own. Um, that's, that's an exemption. The other is a religious exemption. So if a church has housing, um, they can also, they can say, well, we only want people who uh, are within our religion, uh, to, to live here, but it's gotta be a religious organization that is doing, providing this housing, housing as a secondary, um, uh, thing. Um, and then the private club exemption, if you belong to private club, think about country club or whatever, they can, they can rally, they can decide whether only, only to let their members who are members of the, this club live in a certain place. So that's, uh, those are the exemptions from the FHA. There's a little bit of up in the air right now as to whether colleges and universities like dorm housing, whether they fall within the FHA or not. Um, because they, you can see where they could be considered under private club exemption. I mean, they can say only people who go to Texas A&M could live in the dorms. I mean, that makes sense. But then at the same time, you don't want them to say not only from Texas A&M, but um, all white people in this dorm. And then, you know, it could have a different issue. So that hasn't really been decided. I think the consensus generally is, is that they fall under the FHA, 
um, in most universities, at least public universities, will acknowledge that and they'll 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 take the steps to to fall into the FHA. The issues have come up under service dogs um, and that sort of issue, which we'll we'll talk about in a little bit later slide. But I want to get that on y'all's radar. Um, covered that. So, gotcha. I'm going to handle some um, reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications. Uh, which is kind of its own little niche area under the FHA and, and the state acts. And it's just the, the requirements that a, a tenant or a landlord or, or somebody who's selling ways that they can accommodate somebody that uh, in this instance, specifically we're, we're looking for those that are disabled or have, have some kind of disability um, to let them continue to, to stay there, let them continue to buy the house, something, something along those lines. So, um, we'll kind of go through those here and, and talk about what you can do, what you can't do, what you're trying to do, and, and those things. So first, we, we have what are reasonable accommodations and what are reasonable modifications. So an accommodation is a, a change or an exception or, or an adjustment that you have to pop property or a, a policy or a practice that you have in place that allows somebody that has a disability to, to continue to occupy that. Now, most examples that I'll give you and, and where a lot of these comes up are, are landlord tenant, just because those are where you see these primarily. Sometimes you run into them in, in different areas and different settings and the same rules will apply and the same principles will apply. But most of these you kind of see in this, the, the landlord tenant setting. So for example, here um, would be like a, a pet policy. If you're a landlord and you, you say no pets, no pets allowed, but you have somebody who's disabled with, with a service dog well, you can make a reasonable accommodation to allow a service dog in there, which would technically be a violation of your policy, but it is to allow them to come in. And as long as it's a, a reasonable ask and it's necessary for them, you're required to make a reasonable accommodation. Similarly, you have like, for instance, the other one here is trash policy. If you have that your, your tenant has to take their trash to the dumpster behind, but you have somebody who's mobility challenged and they can no longer take their trash out. You can't tell them, oh, sorry, you can't stay here. You can't rent here because the trash is going to pile up. You need to find a way to accommodate them, either have someone help them or provide a way for you to get the trash and take it to them. Reasonable modifications are a little bit different because it's a structural change to the property itself, um, either a dwelling unit or a common area. And generally what you run into here is that a reasonable modification is going to become um, the cost of that is going to be passed on to the tenant themselves. Most instances, there's some some areas, and we'll talk about those in a little bit, where the cost is borne by by the the landlord. But most instances, the modification is the tenants. So here we have wheelchair accessibility ramps, um, accessible lifts. One other example that that saw where there was a, a case and they had a big fight out of it was a shower bar in a shower. Shockingly, that there's a lawsuit over a shower bar, but there's those kind of people out there. And they didn't want to have a shower bar put in there. It was a reasonable modification that they were willing to pay for because you had somebody that was in a wheelchair. No one's surprised here. They found that was a reasonable modification that they could put into the shower. So you run into things like that on reasonable modification. So as I was saying, reasonable accommodation, if someone has a disability, that the landlord cannot refuse to make that reasonable accommodation if it is necessary. And that's really the key word that you're looking for. It's necessary for that person that has the disability to use the house. And that's kind of where uh, the determination is made is, is the necessity of it. Just because it's something that you want or something that you would like doesn't make it a necessity or something that the landlord has to do. Um, similarly, as I talked about reasonable modification, the key here is at that person's own expense. So in most instances, if they want to add a wheelchair accessibility ramp into their home, that's going to be on, on them to provide that to get into their place. You don't have to do that to, to, as a reasonable accommodation. This will be a reasonable modification because it's changing the actual structure to them. It's not a policy change. It's not providing some other service to them. This is a, a structural change to the, the building itself. So what does the FHA require? You have to have housing providers making reasonable accommodations that may be necessary to provide them and, and really what the whole goal there is, that last part of that sentence, an equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling. So just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you don't have the opportunity to run an apartment. Doesn't mean you don't have an opportunity to rent a house. So you just have to find ways and accommodations to make that work. So what do you do as a landlord 
to make these changes, to make these accommodations, to, to find out this information. So you have to accept verbal requests. You can't say only in writing. You can't say anything like that. If somebody walks into your office and says, I need this accommodation, that's sufficient to, to trigger your duty as a landlord to start examining that. And then really you get into the, the interactive process with them and try to find what is necessary as, as the act requires, what is necessary, what accommodation will make it so this, this works for your tenant. Really one thing that you should be doing all along the, the process there is kind of that third one is draft, review, revise, go back to the beginning, drafting, reviewing, revising, go back to the beginning, drafting, reviewing, revising. You wanna have policies and procedures that are flexible and that you look at and that you view. So you make sure that you are putting your tenants in the best spot to be able to, to take advantage of the housing, that you're not caught unawares, that you aren't having an antiquated or an outdated system in place of policies that suddenly are giving you all sorts of fits when people are coming in and needing changes. And then you can always ask for appropriate information about the disability. We will kind of get into what you can't say, what you can say here in a little bit, but that's one of the things you can do. And then you need to provide a prompt response when you have the, the request from, from your tenant. Um, the rules that we have in Texas, you have a reasonable amount of time, which is as subjective as it sounds, but it cannot exceed 14 days. So if reasonable should have been 30 minutes, Someone will tell you if that was reasonable down, down the line, but you just have a reasonable amount of time to respond. And there's really only four responses you can give. You can grant the, re the request, you can deny it, you can offer, offer alternatives, which is again, back to the interactive process of finding what is necessary to make the accommodations, or you can request the additional information that you may need to make a determination on what is necessary. So here are the things to avoid. Don't ask how badly you're disabled. Don't ask the nature of the disability. Uh, don't ask, ask the severity of the disability. And then avoid asking, are you the disabled one? Is it someone else that's going to be disabled? These are kind of common sense things that you would think most people would, would avoid and you'd be surprised. So you just want to avoid that area. Really, your job once you get that request is just start finding out if it's A, necessary, and B, what alternatives you might have to get to that um, accommodation that, that they need. So here are some of the things that you can ask about. Um, again, looking for the what's necessary. So you can ask for information to determine that. You can ask, there's, there's three up there kind of in the middle. Is it necessary? Is there disability that they have? Does it trigger the act? Are they protected as a disabled person under this act? If they if it's not outwardly obvious, you can you can ask, well, what, what kind of disability do you have? And, and, and just because you, you need to determine if the act has been triggered, if what you have to do is to provide the accommodation. You can get information about what accommodation they're asking for. If someone says, hey, I need to get the trash out. Okay, well, is, is that a daily thing? Is, is that just when, when the trash comes at the end of the week? What what are you trying to get so we can really get down and ascertain what accommodation you need? And then you can request more information to determine that nexus because, again, the accommodation is what is necessary. So is the accommodation going to be necessary and is it there a nexus between their disability and the need that you're trying to establish? You can get information there at the bottom. You can get information from a peer support group, from a non-medical provider that, that helps this person. From a doctor, you can you can ask them as long as they're willing to let that person talk with you. You can get information from from all those people to, to determine what you need to do for your accommodation. So then the question becomes: What what accommodations can I just flat out say no? So there's there's really very few that you can run into. If it's a necessary accommodation, it's it's difficult to to tell them no. If the person poses a direct threat, one of the examples that I saw was someone that was trying to get an accommodation because they had psychiatric issues and they had threatened two of their neighbors already with a baseball bat and they were going to take them out. And this person said, I'm, the, the landlord said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't make an accommodation that they, they had a policy in their lease that says, if you threaten someone, we'll give you 30 days and you have to be out of the apartment. And they said, you have 30 days and they were trying to get an accommodation and they could deny the accommodation because this person posed a direct threat. And, and as you see there, it can be including a service animal. If you have a service animal that bites someone, doesn't mean that now they just get to stay there because it's a service animal. 
you can deny that accommodation for them because it poses a direct threat to, to the people and other tenants that you have there. The second one is there's no disability related need for the accommodation. Either they don't trigger the act and the need for you to provide the accommodation or that nexus that we talked about before just isn't there. So whatever they're requesting is not going to satisfy the need that they have for their disability. And then the third one is it's not a reasonable accommodation. So going back to our, the example I've been using is the trash is you cannot ask them to get somebody to come and Uber the trash to the car, to the dumpster for you every time that they need somebody to take the trash. Out. That's just not reasonable. Now we can find a reasonable accommodation that would work. And if we get to that, then you have to provide it. But if it's just a not reasonable uh, accommodation, then, then you don't, you can deny it. Now I do have their note. You can't set specific terms and conditions or privileges based on a disability. And one of the examples that I saw in, in looking at this was if you have a common area pool, you can't have an additional waiver that somebody that's, that's disabled has to sign to be able to use the pool. Just because they're disabled doesn't mean that they have to be treated any differently or can be treated any differently. Your terms and conditions, that has to apply to everybody. If everybody has to sign the waiver, they can sign the waiver. If you're just doing it for disabled people to sign the waiver, you've crossed the line and you can no longer, can no longer do that. So then who pays for the reasonable accommodation? As I said at the beginning, generally that falls on the landlord. Um, most, most instances there, since it's not a structural change, you're talking about maybe a few man hours or reassigning somebody's task or a job. Usually it's not a, a undue financial burden. But then you have the opportunity there in that first one, if it is an undue financial burden or an administrative burden, you can say, look, I, I can't pay for this. You're going to have to pay for it. We can accommodate it, but I'm not going to be the one that pays, pays the bottom line on that. Or if it's going to be a fundamental alteration to their op to your operations. So if you have somebody that can help with the person taking the, out the trash, or you have somebody that can help get a parking spot reassigned for somebody that's mobility challenged that they can then get into their apartment, that's not a problem. Now, if they're asking you to do something totally different, if they ask, for instance, if you rent a condo out and they're asking you to go grocery shopping for them, that is fundamentally different than anything you provide. So you can say, I, I can't pay for that accommodation because that is outside of the scope of anything I would provide, anything I would do on my end. So you can kind of look at these four things. They're considerations. They're not determinative. They're not exhaustive. There's all sorts of things you can use in that determination to see if it's undue financial burden, if it's administrative burden, or if it's just outside your operations. You can look at the resources of the provider, the cost of the accommodation, the benefits, and, and then availability of other alternatives. So really you can run the gamut of anything that you can find. Your, your goal as the provider is just, this is gonna cost too much and I'm not gonna have to pay for it. Or this is gonna add more to anything I've ever done for anybody else that I just, it's, it's outside of the scope of anything, anything I would do. Which is totally different than the modification <laughs> because the modification is gonna be paid for by the tenant, because again, this is a structural change. This is this is a dramatic change. This isn't just can I get somebody to help help here. This is I'm adding a wheelchair ramp, or I'm adding a handicapped accessible shower into a, a unit. So in most cases, the tenant is responsible for the cost of the modification. But there are some questions there that can answer that. We'll kind of dive into a few of these and, and see ways is a single family or multifamily dwelling unit. Um, that you get financial aid from, from the federal government for your housing or from the state for your housing? Is it built for first occupancy? What year was it built in? There's all sorts of things that we kind of run into on that. So the first one is, and I borrowed this from San Antonio because it's a really great chart, um, is a kind of a choose your own adventure for who pays. So you can follow the flow chart. I have a bunch of these printed up and they're currently sitting on my desk at my office. Uh, so... <laughs> I'm happy, I have business cards. If you want a copy of this, I can email it to you. I'm happy to write it to anybody, um, even those that are in the, the Zoom world, just email me. And you can kind of follow the flow chart down to determine what you have to do, who's gonna pay, how they're gonna pay. And, and it's, it's really a, a really handy chart that they, they went through and broke everything down. And I wasn't gonna reinvent the wheel once they had already done it. So this kind of deals a lot. You can see it starts with single family versus multifamily and then gets even into federal funds and into the, the lower income housing tax credits that you see in Texas and different things. So it, it provides you a whole lot of information um, down the line for, for what exemptions you can have on that. 
Uh, one of the things that I mentioned before was the, the receiving financial assistance from the federal government um, and even under the low-income housing tax credit, what they view all those modifications as, is they say these reasonable modifications are actually, we're going to call them accommodations. And because they're accommodations, landlord, this one's on you. So in all those instances, all those modifications of adding, adding parking spaces, adding wheelchair ramps, adding into common areas or into housing and all those changes now become reasonable accommodations and it's the landlord's um, it's the landlord's cost and, and they're the ones that that bear that again unless and, and texas provides the one out again unless it's an undue burden so if you're talking about a four hundred thousand dollar change you're not going to be responsible for that if they want to do it then then again that's that goes back onto the tenant one of the other things that you can look at to determine what is necessary is, is the design and construction requirements. So um, after March 13th, 1991, anything built after that uh, must be designed and constructed that makes them accessible and usable. And this is due to the ADA. And you see all the different on the list there, everybody probably runs into these, knows a lot of these, that you have to now have common areas that are accessible and you have to have an accessible building entrance and anybody that's done any construction knows that if you put a building in you have to have depending on size one handicapped parking spot or two handicapped parking spots and, and ramps and different you have to have bathrooms for different folks there's all sorts of requirements that come with that so this is this list is just kind of a a short list a, a quick quick look list i mean even down to switches and outlets that are in accessible locations so you can't put your light switches 12 feet up in the air. Um, those are all, all required under the ADA and, and just to, to provide again, access to those that are that are disabled. And I think that brings you back in. So not to rehash a lot of what Jay said um, because there's some overlap here, but I, I did wanna go into a little bit more detail about um, service animals um, and, and support animals. So uh, what is a service animal? Uh, the American with Disabilities Act actually defines it. It's a service animal that must be trained to complete tasks that are directly related to the individual's disability. So you see the examples that are listed there, pulling wheelchair, retrieving dropped items, alerting to a sound, um, you know, a guide dog. Those are all a service animal. And that's all uh, service animals are uh, uh, regulated by the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, a support animal is different. A support animal is not regulated under the ADA um, and it, because it does not qualify as a service animal under the uh, ADA. However, the Fair Housing Act, um, it could still fall, a, a service uh, dog, or I'm sorry, a support animal can, re, can fall under the FHA's uh, purview. Um, and so like uh, one of the examples that Jay said is that uh, you may be required to provide reasonable accommodations uh, to somebody uh, who has a support animal, even though in your lease you have a no pet rule, um, or you have a pet you, you require a pet deposit uh, to be paid. Um, and so there, there's certain things that uh, for support animal under the FHA is okay to ask for documentation for. So. Uh, under the FHA for a support animal, you can ask that you can ask that the tenant um, uh, show well that the tenant uh, with the animal has a disability. Um, you can't inqu inquire as to the the severity of the disability uh, or anything like that. Just is there a disability? Yes or no. That's as far as you can go. Um, and then the need for the animal to assist that person with a specific disability. So you just get to ask, okay, so what is the need for this animal? And that's it. And you, you take them for what they say. You can, you can ask um, that there be some documentation provided for all of these three things, including the third one, which is that the, the pet assists the person with that disability. With a service animal that's uh, covered under the ADA, you can't ask for any documentation. You, you just you just can't. It's it's a service animal. It's a service animal. They're allowed to be in there. You don't you don't get to ask any questions about that. Um, you can well you right that they have a disability. But yeah, that's it. N nothing further. Um, and uh, so 
Jay touched on this a little bit earlier. There are some rules, though, with, with, with regards to the pets. They, they, they must be housebroken, um, and the handler, so the tenant, has to be responsible for the care. So if the dog goes and bites somebody, guess who's responsible? You are, the tenant. Not the landlord, not anybody else. You take on the responsibility for that animal. For, for and, and if they're not housebroken, if they bite somebody, and the lease says, if your service, if, if your pet, even though you pay pet uh, deposit, bite somebody, you're out. If your service animal or support animal bites somebody and has been aggressive and, and, and all those things, that can actually trigger uh, getting them evicted. Um, now, you want to tread lightly on those situations. You got to make sure that everything is is um, uh, everything set up and then that there's there's documentation that this it was this service animal and not some other you know, wild, loose dog that's out there. So, um, but it is possible. Um, you also, you can't under uh, limit the type of breed of a dog or of uh, any other pet uh, with regards to a service animal or a support animal. Um, so here are some just best, best practices. Um, you can have a no pet policy, that's, that's fine, but just make sure that you include in there that, um, uh, it, that there's a waiver of the pet policy if you provide documentation of, uh, that you need to support animal and those three things that we went over. Um, and then oh, there's also an, an exemption for a service animal under the ADA. But what uh, one of the things that we, we would recommend is you keep in there the nuisance uh, portion of it that says, hey, if, if you, you can have these, if you, have, if you meet the requirements for support animal and service animal, but just know uh, that if they are housebroken, if they uh, are aggressive, if they bite, whatever, then they're still subject to the other terms of this lease. And that could be, a, uh, you can be terminated from the lease if, if that happens. So what do you do if you have been uh, either discriminated against under the fair housing or, or if you end up getting a complaint made against you? So we'll kind of look at the, the complaint process and what that entails. Under In Texas, there's, there's three ways if you've been discriminated or you think there's a violation, there's three ways to submit it either online, you can mail it in or fax if you actually still have a fax machine. Um, that you can send it in, they have a, a number and, and you can send that off to them and then they start investigating it. And if you have a complaint filed against you, as it says on the side, you get notice of those allegations right away. Um, you're given an opportunity to, to mediate with whoever that is that made the complaint. Um, if you decide you don't want to mediate, which I would always recommend mediate because it's, it's at least an opportunity to go in and get more information and maybe even resolve it. But you have an opportunity then to file an answer against this, uh, the charges or the, the complaint in writing under the penalty of perjury, and you have an opportunity to amend it. So the mediation that they, they provide kind of here's, here's what they, they talk about, and it's my pitch for mediation. Uh, it's a free service that they offer that from when the complaint is filed until it is completely resolved, you can go to mediation at any time in there. Um, it can take out the cost of having to get a lawyer to help. Well, I mean, not that lawyers are bad or expensive, um, but it, it can eliminate the cost of having a lawyer come alongside you and try to respond to the complaint. You might be able to go in there and it could just be a complete misunderstanding and something that can be resolved quickly and the mediation will give you that opportunity. Um, so you get speedy resolution and save time. Now, if you do reach a resolution in this process, it is binding. So now you've, you've reached an agreement the next day, they can't wake up and say, change my mind. I do want to see you. Once you, you've signed off on, on the mediated settlement agreement, that is binding on both parties. Now, on the federal side, uh, the Housing and Urban Development Department is the one that uh, handles those complaints. And, and you can call them, you can file it on their website and file a complaint there. You have one year from when the discriminatory conduct occurred to file your complaint. The earlier, the better. You have more facts, everything's fresh in your mind. So the earlier, the better on those. The HUD will always investigate the complaints. They will let the, the person know that a complaint's been filed. They will talk to that person. They'll let them file an answer. They compile an investigation. And if they determine that there was discrimination, they file what they call a charge of discrimination. And you go to an administrative hearing within 120 days. That's going to cost you a lot of money. So one of the things they push for is they have um, conciliation, which is just a fancy word for mediation. 
Um, and it also is a way for them to, to make sure that it's getting resolved and there's no way. The, the difference really between mediation and conciliation in this instance is HUD is still involved. Just because the landlord and the tenant agree, HUD comes in and says, I'm going to make sure that no one's getting raked over the coals. I'm going to make sure no one's getting taken advantage of. We have to sign off on it. So when you have a, uh, an agreement in the conciliation process, three parties sign off, the complainant, the, the, the respondent, and HUD. Still legally binding, still can, can hold the parties to it, but it's just an opportunity for them to make sure that there's nobody getting strong-armed or, or anything else like that. So that's what happens when you have a complaint in those processes. And I think that kind of brings us to the end of our, our fair housing stuff as to that. And, and now we get to get to the elephant in the room, uh, which is COVID. All right. So um, we are in a pandemic. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, so uh, there's obviously certain different rules, different statutes, different acts, different um, moratoriums, different declarations, all of those words have all been proclaimed by some federal government or some state agency or something uh, since March 2020 to now. And the problem is it's very confusing because it's a bunch of people and agencies kind of not talking to one another, surprise, um, and, and coming up with their own, um, uh, their own guidelines, their own interpretations, their own readings, the way that they they interpret certain things to be, um, and, and how they they sue it. So, um, I guess I wanted to start off with saying that um, explaining how we got here um, and, and, and where we are now. So, um, March 2020, you know, our, our world changed. Uh, the CARES Act was passed uh, by Congress, and that put in place a 120 day moratorium, federal moratorium on eviction, uh, any eviction filings. Um, and it also provided funding for rental assistance programs. All right, so that was pretty clear. Congress acted, they said 120 days, no evictions. We're at the beginning of the pandemic. It makes sense, right? I mean, it made sense. All right. But then in July, that moratorium expired. Um, okay, so now our landlords are thinking, could we, could we evict people now? Um, or we're still in this pandemic. So then uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, not a body of Congress. They don't write laws. Um, they're not elected by the people. Come out with an order, an order. They're not judges either, but an order that in September of 2020, no, seeing that that, more, that 120 day moratorium for ev ev evicting people had lapsed, put in their own moratorium on this September 2020 order by the CDC. Um, since then, that CDC moratorium has been extended various times and the current uh, era, uh, currently it's set to expire June 30th of 2021. Um, before I get to more of the timeline, I, under the CDC moratorium, who was eligible or who is eligible under the CDC moratorium? Well, anybody who earned less than $99,000 individually or $198,000 married finally jointly. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. That's, that's a, that, we're not talking about low income, even when you're looking at the socioeconomic uh, status and, and scale that we're talking about usually for low and fair housing, this, is, this covers a whole lot of people. Um, and so it did, and it still does. And it's in a, but it's only for people who aren't able to pay their rent. So if your service dog bites somebody, you can still get evicted for breaking your lease any other way. But so the CDC moratorium only acts uh, with regards to the inability to pay your rent. Um, but you have to be able to, to show that your household has lost income because of the pandemic, um, that you have a significantly lower work or uh, uh, so you went from full-time, part-time, or that your salary got cut, um, or that you were laid off, um, or that you uh, have incurred extraordinarily out-of-pocket medical expenses. I think the, 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 the consensus was that this was supposed to be it, it, as a result of uh, COVID. If you suffered out-of-pocket medical expenses because of COVID, 
but in reality, there's there's not that differentiation. So if you if between March of 2020 and, and now you've had a whole bunch of medical expenses just in general, you may be able to qualify under the CDC moratorium if you meet all the other uh, criteria. Um, and so if you do meet that criteria under the CDC order, you have to swear under a decl declaration. So under oath, all of those things that all of these things apply. Um, and uh, once you do that, then um, when you meet that that requirement uh in the rent and in, in the the landlord is trying to evict you as a tenant you can give them this declaration you can go to cdc website and download this declaration and fill it in and i i don't even think you need to get it notarized um and you give it to the, to the landlord and under the cdc order the landlord's got to take it and say okay i, I can't evict you um and as you see on the third um, uh, bullet point there, you can still get evicted, like I said, if, if for other reasons, not with regards to paying rent. Um, but the second point is important too, which is a tenant can just put a halt to being evicted, but you still, the tenant's still gonna owe the money, the back rent, uh, including any fees, penalties, and interest that is uh, laid out in the lease. So. It's not a it's not a free pass. You're still going to be having to pay what what was under the lease. Uh, you just get uh, to put a pause under the CDC moratorium. Um, so, is the CDC moratorium applicable in Texas right now? Um, well, the CDC moratorium's uh, uh, wording says that court should take into account the order's instructions not to evict a covered person from rental properties where the order applies. Um, so in Texas, uh, the CDC moratorium order was implemented based on the Texas Supreme Court's emergency order saying, hey, everybody's got to abide by the CDC order. Everybody's got to abide by the CDC order. March 31st, though, uh, the Supreme Court did not renew that particular portion of their, in their emergency order. Um, they know, and so their, their emergency order as it currently stands uh, does not say anything about the CDC order or that the courts have to implement the CDC order. Um, uh, so what does that mean uh, in, in, in terms of uh, where we stand? Where, well, the, uh, you see the TJCTC on that, on that bullet point in the slide stands for the Texas Justice Court Trial Center, Training Center, sorry. They're the, they're the center that trains courts, uh, all the judges uh, here in Texas, and what they interpreted it and what they've told all of their judges is that, hey, because of the CDC order says only where the order applies and the order only applied when the Texas Supreme Court had put it in their emergency order and now it's no longer an emergency order, courts, you no longer have the uh, ability to stop evictions um, because in Texas, the CDC order uh, does not apply. Um, but uh, the TJCTC also says, um, landlords go at your own risk because the CDC moratorium order does say that there's penalties involved and that the US, that the Department of Justice can actually prosecute a landlord for failing to abide by the CDC order. And so what the, the TJCTC uh, has said in their, in the, their interpretation is we don't think that the courts can only apply, the courts in Texas can only apply state law and state rules. Um, and the CDC order does not govern us. However, this may be a federal problem. So landlords, yeah, you may be able to get an eviction and, and, and get somebody evicted, but you may get the Department of Justice knocking at your door. Um, and there's some hefty penalties for violating the CDC order, um, 100, 000, up to $100,000 fine uh, or one year in jail um, or both. Uh, and if it results in the death of the tenants that you evicted, it's $250,000 fine, up to $250,000 fine or one year in jail. Um, and if you're an organizational landlord, so a property management company, or you're just a company that holds a bunch of rental properties, 
uh, that number is up is, is higher than individual landlords. So do you see that $200,000 and $250,000? So basically, yeah, you may be able to evict, but if it's worth it to you, go ahead and take that risk. Um, so um, well, the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which I didn't even know existed before, honestly, today, um, because yesterday I read a, an article that said that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued a rule requiring any third-party debt collectors, including us attorneys, can be classified as, as debt collectors who are attempting to collect uh, rent uh, um, on behalf of a client or on behalf of a landlord uh, that it, with tenants that are protected under the CDC moratorium or that may be protected by a CDC moratorium, if you send them any letter demanding payment or an email demanding payment, you have to put in there this disclaimer that says, tenant, you may be subject to, you may fall into the protections of the CDC moratorium. Um, please go and look that up and see if you are actually qualified and you may not have to pay this rent. Um, so, and if you don't, I don't know what happens because I don't know what, what sort of power this Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has, but that's what they say. Um, so what's going on here in Brazos County? Like, what are we doing here? So what I did in preparation for the presentation is I called the different justices of peace courts who are the ones who deal with the evictions. And I spoke to a few of them um, because unlike the bigger counties, um, Dallas County, Bear County, Travis County, Harris County, on the county level, they wrote a county ordinance um, in those counties that says the CDC moratorium applies to this county. Um, and so then in those counties, because there's been a local uh, county ordinance that applies, so you can't evict anybody um, over there. But here in, in, uh, in Brazos County, we don't have, uh, the county judge hasn't done anything of that nature like they have over there. So I decided to call the Justice of Pieces, see what they were doing, what, what kind of guidance they've gotten, what they're doing well. Um, I spoke with, several of them said, they don't know of any justice of the peace that's actually uh, proceeding with evictions at this time, um, mostly because a lot of them uh, uh, pertain to the, uh, just the, the justice of the peace and constable association uh, that they belong to. And they've sent them their guidance as to, hey, you may not wanna proceed with evictions in your court. And so from the, uh, from the judges that I spoke to, um, last week in the in early part this week, uh, nobody's doing eviction in their court. Um, and, and what they've said is, it's really, it's a no-win situation. Um, it, it's a go proceed with evictions. And um, because, I mean, if you want to evict somebody right now as a landlord, you have to provide them a 30-day notice to vacate. And that's under the CARES Act, which as you remember was back in play in March of 2020 they have a 30 day notice and that didn't expire. You still have to send a 30 day notice to vacate now to the tenants. Um, but now if you wanna file a petition to, for eviction, uh, you have to be able, you have to state in there uh, that the, the property and that the tenant is not covered under the CDC, CDC moratorium or that you don't have any knowledge that they do are covered. Um, but you still have to provide them notice within when you get them served of the different programs that are available for rental assistance, which will, um, which one of them is the Texas eviction diversion program, uh, which is, uh, which has been extended uh, by the Texas Supreme Court emergency order all the way to May 12th, but uh, it's likely to extend further than that. And what happens is a landlord can go ahead and file an eviction uh, if they've provided the notices as they're supposed to. Um, but if the landlord and the tenant agree to enter into this Texas eviction diversion program, um, then everything under that's been filed becomes confidential. Everything, no names, no anything. You go to this program where uh, they, you apply, the landlord and the tenant can apply. And um, this program uh, checks the application and checks to see whether the tenant qualifies whether this is something that uh, that they have the funds to fund however much back rent is being asked for. And if the program accepts it, 
the landlord gets all of their money that they're owed, all of it, and the tenant gets to stay um, there at their uh, at their residence. So it's a win-win, and then the, the lawsuit gets dismissed. Um, one of the issues has been with the tax eviction, eviction diversion program is that you have to have both the landlord and the tenant agree to do this. Um, now, the justice of the pieces that I spoke to, they said that's one of the big reasons why they're not going forward with evictions is because you have this program and you have other programs that are available. And why wouldn't a landlord want the possibility to be made whole under these programs? Why spend the money and resources evicting somebody when you can actually, if you evict them, you're never going to get that money back, the back rent that's owed. But under these programs, you could potentially get everything that's owed in, uh, in back rent plus penalties and interest and all of that jazz, and you don't get to kick somebody out of the, on the streets. So it's 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 a win win for everybody if you go into these programs. The other one is the Texas Rent Relief Program, um, and it provides up to 15 months of uh, rent assistance, but not just rent, also utilities. So the the tenant can go and apply for that, um, but not just the tenant. The landlord can actually apply for tenants that are back in rent and who they who, who possibly qualify. Um, and and uh, one of the things is that Texas actually has $1.3 billion to give out under this program from the federal government, 1.3 billion. As of April 1st, uh, they had uh, the amount, I don't have it in here, but the amount that had been given out was not even uh, a little bit less than 2 million. Um, so they have all this money that they're sitting on, just landlords and tenants need to take advantage of it. And, and the, actually the, the criteria to qualify have lowered. It used to be you have to meet, uh, you know, there's certain uh, income, 50% income or less of the median of the, of the county in which you live, some complicated formula, they made it much easier now. Um, and, and, and tenants are able to apply as well. Um, here locally, uh, the Braz County Community Action Program uh, and the Braz County Rental Assistance Program are also uh, programs that are, are not only helping, my understanding, not only helping administer the Texas Rent Relief Program, but there's also, there's been set aside money from the county to help with that too. So all that to say is there's no reason to evict anybody because there's a whole pot of money out there to help um, landlords and tenants. And so take advantage of you know, those programs. And that's uh, all we got. Do you have any questions? Thank you. I think we, yes. we have to keep coming in. Yes. Um, so I'm not sure that that's why I'm here. Read them out to so you guys. That mic can pick me up. All right. The first question that we have, let me throw up here. So as a landlord, you can't say that you only want to rent to one adult individual. Would that be discriminatory because that rules out those with children? So, so the children aren't actually going to be the ones that are going to be on, on the lease, right? I mean, so um, you're not. I think the issue you'd run into in, in something like that would be kind of getting into that disparate treatment, disparate impact. Of if you're trying to rent and you're saying we only want one adult individual, it is yeah, is, is the target you only want one adult individual or is the target you don't want to have kids in, in in your yeah. in, in your uh, unit now they're going to have to establish if that's what your true goal is if if there is a disparate impact if there is a discriminatory reason that you're doing that policy now on its face it's not going to be discriminatory but they could argue and somebody could argue that the way it's being implemented could cause a, a disparate impact on certain individuals, which then would be a discriminatory impact. And, and you families. might run, run along that. Under or, or not even against families, but also against uh, married couples without without any kids, if yeah. it's only one adult person. Yeah, and the qu let me clarify the question. I ask it because of the reason that they were saying only one individual, adult individual, would be because of space. Like in the instances, it's, it's an efficiency. There's really not room for... Um, a family. I, I would think in that instance, you're, you're probably okay because there's a, again, a reasonable reason for making that requirement. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. The, they said the reason that the, uh, that that policy was in place is because it's an efficiency unit. It, there's only room for, for one person that's in the unit. 
And I would say in, in that instance, it could, again, we, we, we live in a world, could somebody complain that there is discrimination because of that? Sure. Uh, I would say that because your policy is tied to a reasonable basis for it, or the, the policy is tied to a non-discriminatory purpose, which is which makes sense in this case and would be a reasonable policy, I would think that you're in a pretty good spot, I, I would say, to be able to have that policy in place. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I'll also think about it as, you know, in, in terms of if, they, if, if the family has a family of four or five, it could be a health hazard to have that many people and, and an efficiency. And you can you can use that as a basis as well. I mean, it all it all depends on who the renter, who the applicant is that's coming to look for that, the, that efficiency. And you got to sometimes it's kind of sort of you want to use common sense. And I know where it's a little bit scary to use common sense, but at the end of the day, I think common sense, you, you always fall back on the common sense, on your common sense. The second question is, can a landlord require something be restored or made whole prior to agreeing to the accommodation? For example, if an offer was made by an agency slash nonprofit to convert a tub into a walk-in shower, but no cost to tenant or owner, can the landlord demand that a tub be reinstalled after the tenant moves out? I would think in that instance, a lot of it, frankly, comes down to, to what you agree with on the tenant on the modification. Um, you, you run into those, again, what is what is necessary. You look at what, what the act requires. Can you can you do it and, and not, uh, you know, fall into yourself an undue financial burden? I, I know that someone else is paying for it, so installing it's that way, but then having a unit that is outfitted for a specific use could be an undue financial burden again to the to the landlord um, so I think what you you run into in that instance is really what what accommodation and agreement you can make with your tenant in that instance um, I don't know if you would be able to demand that they go back and, and put it the way it was if they have uh, you know if it's a reasonable modification that you're required to make under the ADA um, and it's it's going to be paid for by the tenant then I think it's something that has to be done. Now I think there's there's room there to, to work with a tenant and try to find a solution at the end that works for everybody involved. But I don't think, unless you find another basis to deny the modification, I wouldn't think that you could say no to the modification. It just comes back to what the, the solution would be at the back end. So far, that's all the only questions I have on here. Okay. So if anybody else has questions here. Uh, you mentioned the issue about taking out the trash. So let's say you've got a senior uh, restricted unit, a restricted unit. It's limited, just independent living. And if they have a mobility issue, they're no longer able to take out the trash, and they're going to have other issues come up that affect their ability to live independently. So where does it fit? It, it is a very slippery slope. Um, I think what you have to do is you address each each issue as it comes up, what reasonable accommodation can you provide? I think at some point you're gonna bump up against that fundamental difference of services that you provide. And once you start, or an undue financial burden, once you start getting into those, now if it's if it's somebody to come and take the trash out, maybe you're not there. Now, if it's someone to come and care for the person for four hours of the day, now we're, we're reaching into that area where we, we can deny the accommodation because it is not a, a reasonable accommodation under under the ADA or anything like that. So I, I do think it's one of those things that you have to kind of take a case by case basis and a and a, a scenario by scenario basis. If it's just the trash, we can work with it. If it's helping you unload the groceries from your car into the building, maybe we can work with that. If it's somebody to come in and give you a bath and cook a meal for you, we we probably started crossing that line either into one of those undue financial or administrative burdens or into this is we, we provide independent living there's a reason we call it independent living this is going to be a, a fundamental change to the services we provide and i think there's some value in being able to to relay to the tenant that hey just because we're doing this for you does not mean that we're going to say yes to everything else that you're going to request or that you think that you're entitled to you know, make it make, make it known that we're doing this because we 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 think that this is reasonable. But you know, don't think that this is just an open door, Pandora's box for us having to accommodate you for everything that you might ask for in the future. 
kind of set those boundaries, you know, up front. Uh, on the first part of your, your presentation, you talked about what you can or cannot ask and those things like that. We see a lot of times as a housing choice voucher program where a, a paper or a rental will come up and it'll say, no HUD, no HUD. I have to think that's a You can't, yeah, right. You, there, there's average under the FHA, there's, there's, certain, no there's certain marketing uh, and publication things that you can do. You can't say no children. You can't say, you know, no uh, males, no females. I would think, you know, that that's a little, you're not specifically naming, you know, one of the categories of classified people from the vendor, the FHA. But I mean, it's kind of one of those disparate, you know, impact sort of deals is that, well, but HUD just, you know, by just by its nature involves these socioeconomic uh, individuals or type of individuals or possible applicants that you're discriminating against. And so, yeah, I mean, somebody could actually go and uh, make a complaint against uh, uh, how Jay outlined and they could possibly. I've actually had the, the rebuttal. No, it's nothing against those folks that, that do that. It's, I don't want to do it with the federal government. So, if you ask me to do it with the federal government, I don't ask. I'm not going to do it. it. I think one of the things that that become that you see as things play out and i know we see it in the fair housing side of things we see it in the application of the ada we see it across everything we do in, in our line of work is in a perfect world how things would play out and then in in how things play out practically could someone go make a complaint on that and run it all the way through to the end and get it there potentially the the cost and time and effort and everything that would go into doing that suddenly becomes a, a different a different deal. Um, I think what you'd have to do in something along those lines is just because you're on, you know, federal in, in HUD, you're getting federal assistance, doesn't put you necessarily into one of those FHA groups that are that are impacted. Just because you're on federal assistance doesn't make you one of those groups that now well we, we've been discriminated against. Now what you do fall into is that disparate treatment, disparate impact. The reason you're doing that is because you want to avoid a certain type of person. And the reason you're trying to, that's in there is for that reason. And you can say, no, the reason that's in there is because the issues that we would have with the federal government, and they can come up with anything, any, any other reasons that they want to. And now you're into who, who's, who's right, who's wrong, and, and where you fall. So I think it's what you run into is a little bit of, of the, the real world application versus what, what the, the law would say in a, in a pure law argument, we'd have that point. And you probably say, no, you, you shouldn't be doing that with, with saying no HUD in a real world application that's going to happen. And it's going to continue to happen. The other question I have too, was about um, what you can ask about the disability. Trying to ascertain the nature of the accommodation I can provide with, as a landlord, you need to understand what is it you can do? I mean, I need to know the extent of what's going on, but I thought I heard you say you can't ask about the severity of the disability. So I, we're at an impasse. If I can't ask the question, if you don't tell me, then I'm not just going to give you an accommodation for which I have no basis to understand why I'm doing it. Certainly. And I would say that what, what, what I don't want to, what, what I would have say is avoid to say, how blind are you? If you, if someone walks in with a, with a walking stick, avoid asking how blind are you? Exactly. So I would say to me, that's the, that's the question we say about severity. Now, if someone comes in and says, I have a, a seeing impairment and I need X, Y, and Z, we'll say, okay, I, I need to know what, what necessary accommodation I can make. So I need to know, can you, can you drive? Is it just that you can't drive, but you can, you can still, what, what, what's what level you know what what level of capability are you now that that would be you know it's <laughs> flip that around a little bit but um i wouldn't that that's the thing if someone comes in and and they're in a wheelchair and, they, and they're they're you know paraplegic you, you don't then you know how how yeah how paralyzed are you you don't avoid those kind of things that that would and because you're right what you need to be able to determine is what is a reasonable and necessary accommodation if, if it's not outwardly apparent, you can ask questions to them about what what degree there, and that's and that's part of that. Like we said, get into the conversation with the person. This this isn't this. Don't make it. If there's animosity there, we're in trouble. This is we're trying to find a solution that can work for 
all of us involved. So I think as long as you kind of treat it with with that, as opposed, you know, if someone comes in and they clearly they can't see, you don't need to ask them certain things or you understand. So well, and I think you can tell them, I mean, you're making it hard for me to to agree with you on the, this accommodation without me knowing that. I mean, I get it. You want to respect your privacy, confidential, whatever, but I can't provide you the accommodation that you're asking for without having that information. So I'm not forcing you to, but if you want you want me to help you with these accommodations, you, know, you got to tell me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. If that, that medical information is provided, is that landlord or that tenant protected under HIPAA or any type of um, medical privacy regulations that they have for the I would say, well, if I'm a landlord, I would avoid at all costs taking any medical records, just in general. Um, or you no, know, just like the tenant coming in and uh, uh, informing you of their uh, disability or whatever, and then you have to ask. Sure, I, I would say, I mean, because you the, want the landlord to know not your landlord, his best friend, and everybody down the block, and every uh, certainly, I, I, I would say that just on a on a practical basis tell you tell the landlord what what you would be okay the neighbor knowing um not that they will go tell them but again you don't need to provide them medical records if your landlord's telling you i need medical records to show me how disabled you are we're, we're going down a, a bad bad direction we need to we need to check back and, and and figure that out and that's probably when you call somebody and say we i'm having a problem i need somebody to help me with this because we're not reaching a, a agreement on an accommodation now as a landlord, the, the practical thing is you don't that's don't start telling people about that stuff because you're right. HIPAA becomes <laughs> it comes in fast and it hits really really hard. So so you don't want to have that on on anything you need to be worrying about as a, as a landlord. Now, again, per, practical world versus versus perfect world, I wouldn't be telling the landlord every intimate detail of what I have going on because people are people and they're gonna. It, it might come out and it might get around, but I'm, I'm not sure. And, and I'll let jump in if you want. I don't know if there's any requirement that they not tell somebody, hey, I got a blind tenant that's in freezing. Um, in the way it, I wouldn't do it as a landlord, that's just opening a box there that I don't think you want to. I just don't know if there's any actionable conduct or anything like that, just because you tell somebody that you have somebody that's vision impaired or mobility impaired or something like that. Yeah, and I mean, one of the easiest way to avoid the HIPAA stuff is to get them to sign a waiver of some sorts that says, you, I'm providing you, uh, you know, the tenant says, I'm providing you with this so-and-so medical record and um, I waive any claims or, you know, with regards to confidentiality for the sole purpose of determining whether, you know, appropriate accommodations or not. I mean, that's one way to protect, as a landlord, protect yourself from any possible things that could happen. Now, HIPAA is HIPAA, is HIPAA and it's a federal uh, statute that, that could be enforced by you know, government, state or the federal government. And so it's like Jay said, I would just assume that you are, uh, even if technically you're not, I just assume that you're working under HIPAA and um, keep those things as confidential as possible, you know, shred them if you need to and keep those as private as possible, but that's one way to maybe protect yourself a little bit more. Do you have to just take their word for it? If someone approaches you and says, I'm disabled, I need an accommodation. Oftentimes, I know my folks will ask, show me a doctor, show me a SSI disability stub or whatever. Is it just that he said, she said that? So for a service, <laughs> so for a service animal, yeah, you just have to take it. You know, as is for a supporting animal. Yeah, it's the, it, you you can ask for you know documentation, but aside from pets, I'll let you. Yeah, know. and I would think, uh, kind of like we talked about before, the way and, and Donald says the way for what I would approach as a landlord say I for me to be able to determine what is a necessary accommodation, I need some information. I need to know what you can or cannot do. I need to know what you know, severity, whatever, you know, what your capabilities are so that we can determine what is what is necessary to get there. Now, I think at, to a, at a certain point, you know, you, you probably have to get to, to take your word for it to a certain to a certain degree if you're, you know, going to take them, you know, as what the law says. 
because you really don't want to start going down to that. You really don't want to ask them for information. But again, you can ask for supporting information to show that this is that I qualify because that's that's the other thing on, on those things is you can say, I don't know if you qualify under the ADA. I need to determine if you are under the definition of a disabled person under the ADA. So for me to do that, I need to determine what that disability is. Can you provide me some information on that? Okay. That way you're not telling them what you want. You're just saying that you something to Sure, because there's, there's, I mean, it's a three or four step process. Are you, are you disabled? What's, what's the accommodation? Is it necessary? And then who's going to pay for it? So you kind of have to go through all those steps, and, and you, you have to check all those boxes to get to the end. You can't, you can't skip a step. But under the ADA, you can still ask confirmation that the service animal is in fact trained as a service yes. animal. Correct. And, and I think part of that to have the, the documentation for a service animal, they've kind of already done that that part of it, which is I think part of the reason that if they show you here, this is my service animal information, that's already been done on, on by another department, by either the federal government or the state government saying we've checked all the boxes. This is a service animal for this individual. We're a support animal. No one has overseen that or, or done anything. Back to Mike's question about the housing choice voucher program. If the landlord has screening criteria that requires the, the tenant or the applicant three months to three times the annual rent and monthly income or a cosign for three times the income of what the monthly rent is, is that legitimate? Yeah, I would think so because yes. there, there's no, you're not discriminating against someone based on any of the criteria. Just because they need to have a certain amount of cash in the bank or have the cash in, uh, for a job isn't discriminating against them based on. Okay. Let me if you have a bank with 10 firms, you may at least get a study of the financial records and make independent decisions. You're very likely going to run into disparate impact because the decisions over time will reveal what is believed to be discriminatory practice. If, you're, if you have a formula, you stick to that formula. Uh, regardless of any other factor, those are going to be okay. But you can't, discretion is what kills you. Yeah. We had some apartment complexes in town that got in trouble with that. They were uh, not making clients who came in with cut vouchers prove that they had three times the rent they were making. Other tenants who weren't bringing in vouch uh, cut vouchers showed that they were making three times the rent. And so that was not. Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing, at least that I saw in, in a lot of this, is if you have a policy, stick to it. The, the second you start to deviate for certain people, you're, you're running into, yeah, even if, even if it's bad policy, that's, that's on you for making a bad policy. But if you stick to the policy, at least, you, you, and, and have a basis for that policy, you have something you can point to and grab onto. Of, this is why I'm doing this. It's not, it's not to try to get this type of individual out or this type of group out. There's a reason for it. It's, this is how we do our business. Well, and it's like Jay said, you got to review those policies every so often too to make sure that they're still good. And I'm sorry, I have a question regarding the no credit. Um, if it's a private landlord, I mentioned earlier something about if they do go through a menu or a broker, can they like they can basically exempt from that and they could uh, only choose to rent to people that were if it's, if it's a single family home okay. owned um, by you know, the person that's selling it and they're selling it for, you know by you know for sale by owner you can go you can sell it to whoever you want if you're not using any sort of any so real estate program right mm-hmm. renting when it comes to renting uh, 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 like the, the organization the clubs or those yeah. street yeah so yes as long as it's not more than there's one building four unit okay. um, yeah. Can you own multiple buildings that are one? Oh, no, okay. no, it's just one. It's, and it's meant to be just so if I happen to have a building myself that's got four units, I can go and rent it to my family or to my friends. I don't have to go to, you know, I, I can discriminate in that, in that manner. But once you're more of a commercial one, you've got several. That doesn't apply. I have a question. You're talking to JP. right now. Are there any evictions on those nights besides ramp? Are they still going for an authorized criminal activity or stuff like that? Yeah, that's funny. So I actually I asked that question. So have y'all been doing anything with regards to non-payments that does not under CDC? He said no. I mean, 
they just, but not because they not, they wouldn't just because landlords are not, I think are being really cautious and, and some of them may just not understand that you can actually evict from things that are not just uh, I just have paying a rent. Lost in the courts, and it was for unauthorized, but the judge ruled against them. I think you. I think what we have seen, and I, I can't say I don't know about Brazos, Brazos County. Just I've seen across Texas, and I've seen across the country. Judges are are terrified to evict people right now. I, I don't know why, since they're not. They're not the one paying the hundred thousand dollar fine. If the landlord wants to evict somebody and they, they get in trouble with it, that's on the landlord. But we have seen, and I'm sure you could you can Google real quickly and find these, you know, stories where someone bought a house and the person they bought it from hasn't moved out for nine months because it was in COVID and they were just like, Man, I don't want to move out right now. And there's no way to get them evicted because the courts are saying the, the law says we can't evict anybody, we're not evicting anybody. Um, so I think there's a, the judges are scared to do it. And I also think for the most part, a lot of judges just don't understand what the limits there are on evictions right now. And all they've heard is we, we can't evict people. Now, I know, like I said, I don't think that's necessarily what we're seeing in, in Brazos County, but I think just as judges as a whole, that's what we've seen a lot of is judges are just saying the CDC says no evictions to me means no evictions. Well, that's because they're getting conflicting interpretations from different folks. So. Um, in your research, you showed you showed that if a person makes between what was it, ninety nine and one hundred ninety eight, mm -hmm. right? Good Lord, if someone's renting at one hundred ninety eight, why? Why? It just puts you in an impossible question here. But why is Congress only concerned about evicting the people that are renting, not mortgage holders who are not renting on the mortgage side? I mean, a, a family that makes combined one hundred seventy five sure. are homeowners and working at a restaurant. Lose their house. Because there's so, no relief for this. So one of the things that I read as to the that number is actually when you use that number in California and New York, it's actually not all that, you know, it's not it's not much. Um, so there's a lot of that going on too, that they have to decide how to get to that number. And you know, they have a lot of influence that you know, in that realm is to, to set that number. So but for mortgage holders, they're constantly made sure you have a crisis like this, whether it's hurricane or wildfire or whatever. I'm not saying don't look at renters, but there's mortgage holders as well that are just equally impacted by those disasters as anybody else. Mike, the Senate has to say they had a better lobby in the Congress. That's the answer. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not fair. fair. It's not equal. Yeah. We're in a business trying to let people out of poverty. If we get them into home ownership and they can't keep their house, but they're back in there. It, yeah, it's, it's, it starts the cycle all over again, 100%. And, and so when they have the moratoriums on evictions and, and on foreclosures, what protect the landlord and estimate that payment to go to, to the bank? Right. And that, well, and that's why, and that's why you know, these, these programs are meant to help the landlords. It's just, I think one is awareness, two is making sure that the landlords realize that they're actually better off going this program. Because I think there is this perception that this is to help the tenants and not to help the landlord. But in actuality, it is to help the landlords to recoup the money that they've lost. Jake Bees from Working the Justice Court Training Center and the Building Office so says those are advisors, right? Those are advisors, they're not ready for right. agencies. And so, um, right now, the JPs are, uh, like to say, they're in a precarious position to stop being depressed because of those programs that are making this whole. I would imagine, obviously, those, without those programs, you have a lot of, you have the uh, AG probably weighing in mm -hmm. on some of that stuff. It's just not there right now. Kind of whatever the right so. mm -hmm. Well, and actually, it's, it's to up. Uh, a federal district court in Texas ruled CDC moratorium to be unconstitutional and so it's it's up on appeal um, to be determined but I, I think the reality is by the time all that plays out whether it's found to be unconstitutional or not all of the, we would have already moved past it'll this. have expired and we'll be we'll be yeah, out from under Nothing. It's not this. None of this covers commercial properties at all. 
Now we're staying in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The bodies are going to build long box. Right. <laughs> Are Baker's just as uh, resident to proceed with foreclosure as JP's are? Mike? No, this question. Are our <laughs> bankers from a, a mortgage hold are they just as reluctant to go forward with the foreclosure as a, uh, the renter, the landlords, or the JPs? No. We don't handle it. I want to know that more. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We don't handle it. Residential foreclosures. Uh, but you see them in the efforts that they are going to forward. The, the challenge in enforcing these things is you can't get in front of the courts these days. You know, we're, if y'all have any live hearings, or if we have a Zoom room at our office and have federal court hearings in Houston at 1515 in Plaza on camera. And it, so the speed and Efficiency of justice is very, very slow. It's frustrating. It's frustrating to both sides. So both sides believe they're right. And they want to get it resolved and they can't get there. It's difficult. Well, I think, yeah, that was the only questions I had. Great. Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you all. Uh, next uh, next Saturday night, if you want to see Jay really play people, I'm going to get his next wrestling match. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's May 7th, we'll be out at, at First Friday out in front of the South. So. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> <laughs>